uh, being here for this last session of the uh, uh, day. Uh, just like my session I did earlier today, please don't hold your questions to the end. Uh, ask them as they come up. And also, like my earlier session today, if you have a question that's not necessarily about this very long title I have up here on the overhead, um, I've been doing VFDs and applying VFDs for uh, three decades now. So if you have any questions about VFDs, whether they pertain to what we're talking about here or not, please ask them and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, try and stump me, I've been doing this for 30 years. Let's see if you can stump me, you know. Um, basically this long title, I gotta uh, narrow that down. It's part of a paper that I'm uh, getting published. Uh, first I'm releasing it to the BACnet Journal. So I believe you all are now members of BACnet International from being part of the show. So you'll be able to get the BACnet Journal and uh, like I said, I'm hopefully gonna make it a little bit of a shorter title. Um, but you'll be able to get it and the paper is done. I just got a, it's 2,500, 2,800 words right now and they like smaller for, for magazines and I got to add all the figures and stuff like that, but it's, it'll be probably November or December issue of the BACnet Journal. And then I'll probably spin it out to heating, piping, air conditioning, or one of the nationwide circulation magazines as well. But so as you might've heard in the earlier talk, uh, Direct co serial communications have been available to VFDs since 1994. In 1994, we approached Johnson Controls and said, give us your protocol and their N2 protocol. We then wrote the code and embedded that into our product as part of the VFD. In 1995, we developed LOMWORKS, which was an option card. It still is an option card because LOMWORKS communications requires a, a chipset, so hardware and cost. So we didn't want to burden every one of the 150,000 VFDs we build a year in our, our factory in Wisconsin with that cost. So that's an option card. If you need lawnmowers, you add it. In 95, uh, we were the first uh, drive manufacturer to embed Siemens P1 protocol. They now call it FLN protocol in our product. Um, it uh, uh, used to be called P1 stood for proprietary protocol one. They call it Floor level network now FLN because once they gave it to us in '95 or '96, it's no longer proprietary, right? And uh, uh, there's now that was application number 2700 was the points list of the 95 points of information in the Siemens uh, uh, VFD catalog, and they're now up to 2760 something. So there's 60 different vendors of different products that Siemens is now allowed on their wire. And then in 2004 we embedded BACnet into our late, latest generation of product and immediately went and got it BTL listed. The BACnet testing labs does tests and says, yes, you play nice on the wire with the other devices out there. Um, and then in 2008, we embedded BACnet in a bypass. So a variable frequency drives in the old days, 30 years ago when I started doing this, drives blew up on a regular basis. And so, in a critical application hospital or something like that, consulting engineers always specified bypass, which is basically a combination starter that goes around the VFD. If anything happens to the VFD, you can still run your fan full out. You don't have any control, but at least you're getting air moving. So 2008, we said, just because you're in bypass doesn't mean you shouldn't still be in control and the building automation still can see what's going on. So we embedded, BACnet, Johnson and Siemens in our bypass as well, and Modbus as well. So, serial communications have been around a lot. I've already uh, uh, thrown out some numbers, 95 points of information in the drive, there's 53 points of information in the bypass. So, a uh, tremendous amount of information you can glean from the drive. So today what we're gonna cover is that serial communications controlling fans and pumps allows you, if you mine the data that's available, to do enhanced energy saving strategies. You can use the data that's fed back to make decisions and shed energy load and energy uh, optimization on your building. We're also gonna talk a little bit about where we're going, which is to use this real time information to do predictive and preventative maintenance strategies. Also, once again, mining the data that's already there and using that for uh, implementing advanced features. So, VFDs are all over the place. And uh, uh, the main reason, of course, is drives save so much energy. I 
think I said in my first talk this morning, the air, air conditioning system in this building was undoubtedly designed for that 130 degree day that happens you know, once every 10 years in Vegas. It's only 98 degrees outside today, so you can back off. You don't need full flow, full power out of the air conditioning system. And the affinity laws or the fan laws are, uh, say that horsepower drops is the cube of the speed. So at 50% speed, you only need about 12.5% horsepower to move the air down the ductwork. Static pressure drops is the square of the speed in both centrifugal fans and pumps. So because of that, energy's uh, savings is, is very large. Uh, we talked to somebody at the booth today that's got some makeup air units in one of these big casinos. He says he's going to his management, just say, I got plenty of makeup air. There's eight 60 horsepower units on starters right now. So what if I take it down to just 56 hertz? I'm not even going to spend the money to add controls and stuff. It's just makeup air. I'm not controlling pressure or anything. How much is that going to save? We've got all our little energy estimated savings programs. They're going to pay back like four months because of the cost of energy they pay in Vegas. And these are 24-7 operating fans and 60 horsepower. It's, it's a no-brainer. Just going down that little bit in speed creates a tremendous energy savings. Also then, um, ASHRAE 90.1, uh, probably in the early 2000s, came out and said every fan above 7.5 horsepower or up, you must have efficient part load control, knowing that buildings are not loaded full load all the time. Uh, and really the only efficient way of getting that and the easiest way to get that is VFDs. You could put a hydraulic clutch in there, but then you got to deal with hydraulic fluid and, you know, VFDs are the easiest way to do that. Also, uh, any pump, 25 horsepower up, is required by ASHRAE 90.1 to have efficient part load control VFDs. So, um, like to tell you, we've set sales records for the last 18 months because I'm so good at my job, but it's partially good due to the fact that it's a, it's a law, it's a rule. You got to build uh, buildings that meet ASHRAE 90.1, and to do that, you need VFDs. Okay. So, <clears throat> when you look at a typical supply fan in an HVAC system, it's going to require typically about five points or objects, as BACnet calls them, to control that supply fan properly. So, from the BAS to us, or a time clock, even start-stop command. So, in the building I work on, I work in the manufacturing facility in Wisconsin, in the office area. Uh, I was in there at 5 o'clock in the morning uh, Monday before flying out here, and I heard the air handler kick on at 5 o'clock in the morning. So it's time to do the morning warm-up, you know. And uh, we also need a speed command. So either a 4 to 20 milliamp where the control system is being done elsewhere, the PID loops being run in the energy management system or the building automation system, or as I just demonstrated this morning with the demo case up here, you can bring the static pressure sensor directly back to the VFD and use the PID loop built into the VFD, and, but you still got to run those two wires, right? You still got that, that point. Uh, thirdly, safeties, overpressure. Uh, yes, sir? I'm sorry, the, the drives, modern drives except anything from 0 to 20 milliamps or 0 to 10 volts DC. So it'll accept both of the comments there, all three of the common signals that are out there. 2 to 10 volts has really become popular because in the brains of the VFD, one of the things we invented late 90s was programming in the VFD to say what to do if the wire gets cut, if the static pressure sensor fails. You can go to a preset speed, you can do nothing, which means if you're allowing us to do the uh, serial communications gets compromised, we'll just keep controlling like I demonstrated this morning. Uh, you can uh, fault and shut down or you can stay at the last speed. So we take a snapshot once a second for 10 seconds and have it in a buffer there. And if we lose the 4 to 20 milliamp signal or the 2 to 10 volt DC signal, we'll just average it and stay at that last speed and send an alarm contact out. Okay. So <laughs> The problem is, of course, if you've got a 0 to 10 volt DC, how do we tell if the wire's been cut? There's nothing less than 0. So that's the prevalence of 2 to 10 volts of why that's come out so popular lately in the, in the industry. Um, so one or more safeties. I always recommend hardwiring those back to the VFDs. We can do that over the building automation system, but Social Security Administration in Washington, D.C., we blew the, well, the during startup, 
and commissioning, they blew the seams out of two custom air handling units. And the problem was these were exhaust systems on an atrium in the Social Security Administration building. And the VFDs were on the emergency power system because it was for smoke evacuation on, in a fire mode. And the energy management system wasn't. <laughs> So the safeties were wired to the energy management system and they were going to tell us over serial communications to shut down when a safety shut down. And they did the generator test and transferred the 125 horsepower drives were still pushing it out and the fire damper slammed shut. And we blew the seams right out of the air handlers. And then they did it again on another one. <laughs> they didn't stop to figure out what was going on. They were going on the bingo check cards, you know. So anyhow, I recommend hardwiring this, the safeties to the VFD. Because if they would have done that in that case, the drive would have shut down and it wouldn't have been any issue, right? Um, also, run status. We always want to let the building management system know when the VFD, when the fan's running or the pump's running. So, and then finally, a okay faulted status. So we feed back to the building whether you're faulted or not, right? So with the advent of modern serial communications now, you can land the one twisted pair, it's actually three conductor wired with a shield is the proper way for VFDs and BACnet. You need the plus, the minus, a reference, because our board is floating, because there's 650 volts DC right behind the board you're landing it on. You don't want that going down that wire. So uh, three wires and a shield. And now you get, as I mentioned before, over 100 points of information free. As soon as you land that wire, you got ton you know run stop control and all that, plus you got all this other information, right? So instead of pulling 10 wires, five sets of wires to the VFD, now you pull the twisted pair, the safeties, and the feedback if you're gonna do that to the VFD. Or you can send, if it's a small network with not a lot of devices out there, you could do the PID loop in the energy management system, just send us a speed command right over the backnet system. So that's up to it. But two hard wires for sure, I recommend. Okay. So that first is saves installation costs. You got less wires pulled to each VFT. Um, plus it's also saving points on the energy management system. There's a certain amount of hardware points involved in a, you know, pick a unitary controller. And we used to use up five of those. Now we're using up two with the safeties. So Counting the information out of the bypass, there's over 100 points of information back and forth between us and the energy management system. So the five basic points are pretty much on every installation, whether you're hardwiring or using serial communications. In the 18 years we've been doing serial communications, some of the other points we found that are very popular with consultants or end users and, and uh, energy management professionals is power. So either instantaneous kilowatts or amps tells you how much power the fan's requiring at that point in time. Uh, cumulative power, like kilowatt hours, that's a big uh, um, one for the uh, uh, consultant community and the energy management facility community. And once again, those you could have done with analog outputs. So run another set of wires. Don't need to with serial communications, it's there. Uh, operating hours is another one. Often you have to uh, are required, like in performance contract, to do uh, verification and validation report to verify that you're saving energy. So I told the story of this morning about it's $800 kilowatt hour meter and operating hour meter that you used to add to the motor control center feeding the fan. It's all in the VFDs. You don't need to buy that $800 worth of meters. But more importantly, to get the data, in the old days, some poor schmo had to walk out with a clipboard and look at the operating hours and reset it and look at the kilowatt hours, document it, reset it, and then go back to his office and enter that data into a spreadsheet so he could use it for something. Now you can have the building automation system automatic generate that report. Once a month it goes, gets the kilowatt hour data, sends a reset command, gets the operating hour data, sends a reset command. You got your report built with no human intervention whatsoever. Okay? Um, another big one is proof of flow. Want to know when the belt breaks on the fan. That used to require yet another point in the building automation system for a Hawkeye type current relay. So with VFDs, it's a little more difficult to tell when there's a broken belt, right? Because if you're on a starter, the difference between full load amps and no load amps is drastic. But on a little five horsepower motor, when you're down at like 15 hertz, you're already darn near no load current. 
So being able to differentiate between when you're running a fan at 15 hertz and it's really moving a little bit of air, or when the motor's spinning, but the belt's broke, so you're not moving any air, the VFDs have the technology to do that. It's a little more difficult without the VFDs. So in all of our energy uh, systems, all of our optimization systems with the different building management companies, one of those 95 points of information is broken belt. We call it underload, system underload. So we can program the VFD. If, they, if you're not delivering flow, send a, send a contact, send an output to the energy management system. Once again, no wires need to be run. You're just looking at the data. Yes, sir? Not if you would have had that done in the VFD, because you got the supply and return fan. On the supply fan, you go in and you program in it, and you say, and we're looking at torque. We're not looking at amps. We're looking at power is how we drive our contact. Our, our trigger is triggered by power, okay. not amps. Okay? So there is a substantial difference between when a motor spinning with a fan connected to it and a motor spinning with no fan connected to it. So Right, we program it into the keypad, we run it at 15 hertz and say this is what it should be and then we set a trigger that if it goes below that and it's running to send an output. So people in the old days used to hardwire this, now it's one of the points back on the energy management system. So even though the return fan is still supplying air and moving air, that supply fan, we know that it's off. One of the new things that happened in 2008 with the advance of, uh, advent of smart bypasses, we can also do that detection in bypass mode too, because we got a microprocessor in our bypass just like we do in the VFD. Now that's much easier to detect, because you're at 60 hertz. When the belts are on, you've got this much amps. When the belts are off, you're, it's easy, right? But you needed the microprocessor brains to be able to set up that programming and send that output. And then the bypass, once again, can be uh, connected to the energy management system, give it a point for or a, a node on the wire, your address six, Mr. Bypass, and get those 53 points of information, including that proof of flow. So we have one output called system proof of flow. Whether it's in drive or bypass mode, it's going to send it back to the energy management system. That's relatively new. Um, another thing oh, end users often want to know is speed. How fast is this fan running? Uh, they use that thing for, uh, for starting lad pumps, cooling towers. I get this lead cooling tower up at 56 hertz. If it stays above 56 hertz for 10 minutes, probably means I should turn another tower on, another cell. So that's one of the very popular points that we use back and forth. So I, I should have mentioned, the idea is, of this talk, what I'm trying to get across here, is there's whatever 53 plus 72 back net points is. It's over 100 points of information. You don't want to pull all 100 back to your front end or you're going to tie up the network, right? You got the certain bandwidth on this wire, you want to get the important ones and not the, so the point of this talk is to try and help you discover or, or decide which are the important points of information you want back on the front end, right? Um, faults, you can get fault information back and I'll give you a real world example on where someone used that to remote set a fault when they can see what the fault is, eh, I don't need to go, I think I know what's going on there, reset it from his home. And then we now, once again with modern VFDs, are doing the math in the VFD of saying how much energy you've saved. So the way we do it, we run the system in bypass, it's called a learn mode in the bypass. We run it in bypass and run the application for, it's adjustable uh, hours, but default is like 24 hours, I think. and our microprocessor remembers how much power it took to run this air handler 24 hours. And that, that sets that at the baseline. During startup, our commission agent goes in there and says, okay, my local cost is 10 cents a kilowatt hour. He enters that into the brains of the bypass. And from then on, whenever you're running in VFD mode, it subtracts the baseline from the, uh, the power we're using now, multiplies it times your cost of energy, and puts it right up on the keypad, says here's how much I'm saving and sends that back to the energy management system. In addition to that, we do calculations for how much 
CO2 we avoided putting in the atmosphere because you didn't burn the electricity or burn the coal to make the electricity that we didn't use because we're operating at reduced flows. Okay. So <clears throat> some of the examples of where you use this information. Power can be used, power output from the VFD can be used for load shredding, uh, shedding strategies. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Uh, peak energy avoidance. You can use when the drive gets to this certain level of power, I'm going to change set points in the building and avoid setting a new peak demand for this facility. Uh, chill water reset. I'm going to give you an example. It's an unusual one with a thermal energy storage system that we did for chill water set point and got four and a half month payback on 84 drives. So I'll talk about that. Frequency I mentioned a little bit. Lag motor start for cooling towers. Time to start another cell. Uh, pumps. This one pump's been running for 58 hertz for 10 minutes. Eh, I probably could use another one, make sure I'm not going to run out of, out of pressure here. Start another pump. Uh, current, I spoke briefly about broken belt. It can also tell you that I've got a, uh, a loss of suction condition on a pump. Uh, loss of low. And then I'll give you some examples on load shedding. One of the things I demonstrated this morning is night setback. So during the day, the VFD is controlling static pressure. So you want to keep a nice static pressure in this room. At night, the building automation can always magically switch us from, in ABB terminology, from reference, one, or reference two to reference one. And then we'll run 30 hertz all night long, or excuse me, 30% speed, 20 hertz all night long. So I'm stirring air in the building. I'm keeping hot spots from developing. I'm keeping the computer servers in the building happy because I'm moving air. I don't lose control of my building. Uh, so I'm keeping the humidity under check and, and keeping the temperature under check. And then the next morning, once again, at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning, when it's time for morning warm-up, morning cool-down, the system automatically releases it back to PID control. And we go back to it controlling individual zones. Okay? Is that the thing about occupied? Exactly. Occupied and unoccupied. And to us, the unoccupied, we want to still keep air moving, but I don't care about control and pressure anymore. I'm just stirring air in the building, keeping the building... Keep from losing the building. Um, when you can see the last fault, not only can it allow you to do the next point there or reset the faults, but also you can fix, well, our service techs use this, you can fix a VFD in one trip instead of two. Instead of driving to the job site, looking at the fault information on the keypad and then driving back to your office and getting the parts to fix it, often by looking at the fault and what the fault is, you can say, for example, I get a over temperature fault in the VFD. It either means the fuse is blown and I'm operating single phase input to the VFD and so it's, it's cooling fan is not operating full or I've got a failed cooling fan. So I'm gonna throw in my truck fuses in a cooling fan and fix it in one uh, trip instead of two, okay? Um, we had a, I talked about remote reset and that's gonna be one of my favorite examples I share with you here in a minute. Um, but we had a large chip manufacturer, uh, very close to here, in Arizona, that was having problems with other equipment in their facility. Uh, relays were failing, uh, motors were dropping out and pulling back on, and they had placed some power monitoring systems around but never caught the issue. Well, in the chip manufacturing process, they use a a lot of VFDs. There's a, a bunch of VFDs in this facility. And this happened to be Siemens uh, building uh, system. So the, all our VFDs were hooked up to the FLN network. And what they did in the Siemens land, when they're going to trend a point and store it, store the data in their front end, they call it unbundle the point. So on all 100 and some VFDs in this building, they unbundled the percent or DC bus voltage point and trended it and stored it. And sure enough, they found the certain VFDs over in this area of the building, the DC bus is, is linked to the AC line. If the DC bus is moving around, it means your AC line voltage is moving around. So they were able to, from uh, working backwards, from which VFDs were, were exhibiting this, you know, the drives weren't having any problems. We ride through that. We're very tolerant of voltage fluctuations if you don't have a bypass. And now with the new electronic bypass, we've fixed that. The bypass used to be the weak link for years and years. The drive would ride through power dips, but a bypass is what? It's a contactor. And its, it's tolerance is 480 volts plus 10 minus 10. 
gets below there, the 104, 480 volt, the 115 volt uh, uh, transformer is only putting 70, 80 volts to the coil of contact, or it opens up. So the VFD is fine, but it's not connected to the motor anymore because there's a contactor on the output that bounced open. And then worse yet, if it's just a, a blip when you're transferring hospitals once a month do an emergency generator test. When they go from utility power to generator, there's a blip. The, out, the drive's running, that output contactor goes boom, boom. <laughs> In the old days, it used to blow up drives. Uh, more modern drives will trip and shut down with once again putting a regulated power supply in the electronic bypass, it'll either ride right through that and you won't know anything happened, or if it takes a long time to transfer from generator power to uh, utility or vice versa, it will do a controlled shutdown and controlled open that contactor and stop the VFD. And when the transfer happens and the 480 volt gets back to stabilize, it'll do a controlled start right back up. So you no longer have to go running around the whole building and press and reset on all the, all the VFDs, okay? So, by using this fluctuating DC bus voltage, this, this chip manufacturer was able to narrow down that, okay, it's happening in this part of the facility, and it turned out they were starting like a thousand horsepower motor across the line, and that was causing a tremendous fluctuation in the voltage and causing these other relays and other failures, and they tracked it down by mining the data from the VFTs. It had nothing to do with the VFTs. So a lot of information can be gained from these, this control. Now this morning I demonstrated, so we've been doing this for 18 years. About, well, 2004, we decided let's turn over the points that are in the VFD to the building automation system. We call it expose the points to the building automation system. So example, relay outputs. We've got Form C relays in our product, three of them as standard, you can get six. The bypass has got another five. So if I want to do something like, open an isolation damper over the building automation system, I can say, fire that relay in the VFT. We're connected to the solenoid, it opens up. I want to uh, uh, force it to bypass. I can fire a relay, force it to bypass. Now, once again, with brains in the bypass, you don't need to fire any relay anymore. It can be done right over the energy management system. Um, once again, that lag pump start. I can take the relay output from this drive and fire it and use it to start the, the other VFT. So we turned all of our points that are in our VFD over to the building automation system and allow them to use our, our points for free. In addition, we have analog outputs and inputs on our VFDs. Once again, we expose those to the backnet system. So some of the examples here we use is uh, cooling tower chill water bypass valve. We often have VFDs that are doing the complete control of cooling towers with no building automation. We've got all the brains built in the drive to do that. Uh, we've got a 6 l tower system out in New York City that in the morning when the sun comes out, VFD 1 starts tower 2. That VFD, if that one gets to 50 hertz, relay output starts VFD 3. If that one gets to 52 hertz and stays there for more than 5 minutes, it starts 4. Boom, 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 start them up. And then at night when the sun goes down and building, people go home from the building and load, the drives slow down. When this one, the number 6 gets to a certain frequency, it goes to sleep. It turns itself off. Five foot out, all the way down to where there's only one tower running again at night. And that one can go to sleep if it goes down all the way. Um, that automation is all built right into VFD, or you can do it over the backnet system. So in addition to that, we do chill water valve controls, hot water valve controls, anything that takes a four to 20 milliamp signal, we can output from our VFD and help control other devices. Anybody in here work at an energy management system? Or? A work for an energy management company? Sometimes I get the questions like, do the energy management companies like you doing the, that kind of control? And the answer is most of them. Most of them understand that we're not trying to steal business from them. What we're trying to do is make a, a more complete system. Uh, less boxes on the wall mean less things to fail. Makes them more competitive if they are bidding a project, they won't have to put as many of their boxes on the wall because they can use the VFD is going to be there. By ASHRAE 90.1, it has to be there. Use it free points, okay? Um, once again, we had a high-rise building where they were thinking they were going to have to run 20 floors of wire that wasn't installed when the building went up from a sensor up on the a top floor all the way down to the pump controller in the basement. Somebody came up with a bright idea. 
why don't we just wire it right to that VFD that's right next to here, and over BACnet, we send that signal back. It has nothing to do with the control of that drive on that fan. It's being used to control the pumps in the basement. But over BACnet, they wire to our unused analog input. We send that feedback down over the BACnet system. They use that to control the pump. Saved them from running 20 floors of wire. Okay. Um, all VFDs, you know, modern VFDs have two, four, six PID loops in them. One of the things we do is we have a, and I'm from Wisconsin where it gets cold in the winter, and we switch from outdoor cooling towers in the summer to plate frame heat exchangers in the winter inside the building, towers get shut down. So in the summer, we have one PID gain settings integration, XL, D cell settings, and when you switch to the heat plate frame heat exchanger inside the building, it's a much shorter loop, you need different settings. Once again, over the energy management system, you summer, winter, bam, bam. You just switch to the, to the second batch of PID settings. Uh, and then finally, what was added most recently is a free PID loop for customer use. So uh, one or more PID loops to where you take a, and the, I showed it on the uh, example this morning, you take a, a chill water sensor and land it on RVFD over serial communications over the BACnet system, you say, here's the set point I want, and then connect the chill water valve actuator to the four to 20 milliamp output from our VFD. We do the PID loop, compare feedback to set point, and adjust our four to 20 milliamp output. So it's free PID loops built in. Any questions on any of this? I'm going pretty quickly here. Yes, yes sir. Okay. That's right, right? Yeah. So you didn't have a question, you're just getting the document? Yeah. I also have it on my uh, jump drive here, if you have a computer with you. Okay. I thought, uh, let me page forward a second and see what's the next one, I'll keep going. Okay, uh, using gradually increasing current. Are, are you, you got it? Okay, um, we've used this to get rid of differential pressure transmitters across filters in an air handler unit. Once you set a baseline, and actually we started doing this with a company called Symmetrics out of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, the president, Mr. Jim Lee uh, of Symmetrics came to me and said, Mike, I'm always hearing your talks about 95 points of information. All this. What can we use in our infometric system for that to do proactive stuff on the system? Well. One of the things is if we know at 40 hertz, when it's 80 degrees outside, this air handler should take about this much power to move the air down the ductwork. We can set a threshold that says when it gets above this much power, it means the filter's dirty, time to change the filter. It's taking more horsepower because it's pushing through a dirty filter. So that saved whatever the cost of the differential pressure transmitter is, plus the wiring of that back to the energy management system and all that, it's all just monitored, done automatically, okay? Um, Current fluctuations. When a belt slips on a motor, on a fan drive, what will happen is the amps will drop to nothing or very low while it's slipping, and then the belt will grab and amps will shoot back up. So we can monitor that, and if it starts this, print out a work order, say send somebody to tension this belt before it breaks and becomes a, ah, my, my system's down. Okay? So real-time information means you can do these proactive type things. And then constant high current before we invented the Eclipse bypass that has serial communications capability built in the bypass. One of the ways we would know that somebody's put it in bypass is monitoring the amps and know that, uh oh, this thing's not saving any energy. Let's get somebody out there to figure out why it's in bypass and get it back into automatic drive operation to get that energy savings back again. Okay? Or they put the drive in hand and ramped it all the way up to full speed. Once again, now we can tell that automatically in the points list from the, via, uh, the bypass itself. Gradually increasing drive temperature. One of those 95 points of information is what's the temperature of the, of the heat sink in the VFD. It starts increasing, you set a threshold in the energy management system. When it gets to this point, it means it's time to go blow out the heat sinks. They're all dirty and, and plugged up so the drive's not cooling itself properly. Uh, other thing is on the bigger horsepower drives, we have filters on the big floor standing units. Those get dirty, the temperature increases. Um, time to change the cabinet filters. Once again, from current bouncing around, it may be broken belt, it may mean something mechanical is going on. I got a bouncing check valve. 
I've got a, excuse me, motor bearings going bad, vibration issue going on where the whole system's vibrating. Okay, so there's a lot of information you can you can pull back. And then I already talked about these capability of when a trip happens, looking at the fault information and making the decision of reset the fault or no, I'm going to go see what's going on and maybe I'll take fuses and a spare fan in the, in the truck with me and fix it in one trip. So give you some real world examples of where we use this. In Philadelphia, we had a high rise building, had uh, about 60 VFDs in it. And the building owner got a surprise bill from PPE in the mail one day for $50,000. And what had happened is in the hot summer afternoon, the building had set a new peak demand. And this utility had a ratchet clause in their building structure. So they said, this is for the last six months. Here you go, 50 grand. And the building owner called the Siemens Building Technology, controlled the building, and got them in there and said, what, the, what can I do to make sure this never happens again? I don't ever want to get another $50,000 surprise in the mail. And the first proposal, God knows why, is they were going to put potential transformers and current transformers on the 12,800 volt service entrance to the building, bring that information back to their energy management system and do load shedding if this happened. Well, it's like 60 grand worth of hardware. I mean, those 12,800 volts doesn't get installed cheaply. You gotta have guys out there that, in the suits, right? So um, the owner said, your cure is worse than the disease here. You got any other ideas? So they called our, our, our rep and we came up with the idea of let's rent a chart graph recorder for a month. Let's put it on the secondary, the 480 volt side of the service entrance of the building. And once again, this was Siemens, so they unbundled the percent power point. And all 60 VFDs, they for a month kept track of what's the power. And then we rented chart graph recorder. Then a month later, we got into the big conference room table and set all these graphs out. And sure enough, one of the air handlers tracked with the building load. It was lockstep. A uh, penthouse air handler, like a big 60 horsepower air handler. When the building was loaded up, so was this air handler. At two o'clock in the morning when the building amps and, and power was real low, so was that air handler. So in the building management system, the Apogee system, Siemens simply wrote some code that says, if this VFD ever gets up to 85% power, I'm gonna send a new set point out to all my air handlers. Change from an inch and a half of static pressure down to an inch and a quarter. The VFDs back off in speed, shed load off the building. We did trial and error. Originally we had it set for three hours and usually it would happen about two o'clock in the afternoon in Philadelphia. The VFDs would back off in speed and at three hours of an uh, inch and a half down to an inch and a quarter, tenants were calling, well, it's getting hot in here, what's going on? So we changed it to two and a half. To my knowledge, it's still running right now for an hour and 45 minutes. We do a setback and then the system automatically changes it back to the inch and a half of static pressure and they've never come close, they're back to their original demand right now. They've uh, never set another peak demand, never got close. So that hour and 45 minutes is where they had to avoid. Okay. So I don't know how much the Siemens guys charged them for writing that code, you know, probably $45,000, but whatever. It was basically free because the drives were there and the information was there, just mining the data and using it. Another one, um, we did a computer estimated energy savings for a, a building in Dallas, Texas. And this building, it's called uh, City Place, was originally designed to have two 84 towers on a plaza, 84 floor towers on a plaza. And in the mid 80s, the oil patch went down and the developer decided to only stay with one tower. He never built the second tower. It was going to be a stage construction. Well, the chill water plant under the plaza was designed for two 84 tower, 80 floor floor towers, and they only got one. So uh, Prentice Properties, a guy named Jim Moore, real smart cookie, came in there and said, well, I've got all this chiller capability. I'm going to make ice at night using these chillers and then turn the chillers off during the day when the Dallas power is real high and do thermal energy storage. And at the same time, he wanted to do VFD retrofit. On each floor was a carrier air handler with a supply and return fan on each floor. So it's 42 floor towers, 84 VFDs. 
So we did our little computer estimated energy savings program and based on the cost of kilowatt hours in Dallas, Texas and the amount of hours a day this building was occupied, we told them two and a half year payback on these 84 frequency drives. That's good enough. He put them in. Then he put in a new energy management system and he started monitoring percent power out of the VFDs and realized that the, he could use that information to implement a chill water reset strategy backwards from what you'd normally. So, so what he would do is if any of the rooms got above, it was something ridiculous. It was like 50% power. These were, these were oversized air handlers. So if any of the VFDs got above 50% power, he'd look at the entire air quality sensors. He had uh, uh, CO2 sensors mounted and he'd check those. If those were okay, he'd change a mixing valve in the basement. He'd push more water across the ice instead of around the ice and lower the temperature of the water going to the coils, opposite of what you'd normally do in a chill water reset. Well, now the rooms get satisfied faster, so the VFDs back off even more in speed. Well, what nobody thought about, including me, was if you move less volume of air across the coil in Dallas, Texas, the chill water loop picks up less heat over that 12 hour day that you then don't have to reject at night building ice. So while we saved them a lot of money with the 30 horsepower supply and 20 horsepower return drives, where the real savings came is he went from running 1200 ton chillers six of them from running them over 11 hours a night to five hours a night. He called me back and said, Mike, we got a four and a half month payback on these 84 frequency drives by mining the data and using that to make better energy management strategies and implement better strategies. Okay. So one of my favorite ones, it was uh, in the beginning of serial communications. This is before BACnet. This was uh, done with a Johns control system. So, but very powerful. Take the data and use it. And then the last one, my favorite one, good, running just right. Um, we have a hospital in uh, Kentucky where we had, at the time, 27 variable frequency drives in there. And they had no connection to the VFDs. They were just hardwired control, start, stop, and speed command and safeties. And I went in there with our local HVAC rep with my demo case and a computer program where I have Johnson Medicis Companion is one of them. I have, I have a lot of different energy management systems on my notebook computer. And I hooked up to this demo case and we showed them some of the fancy stuff we could do. Like, how many were in here this morning? You were here, right? Anybody else? Okay. So um, I was doing just like I did this morning. And in this meeting, we were in a construction trailer because the hospital was expanding so much that the director of facilities office was outside in the construction trailer. He no longer had an uh, office inside while they were blowing out the walls and expanding his hospital. And in the meeting was me, my HVAC rep, a guy in a suit coat, the director of facilities, and a technician in jeans. And I'm showing him start, stop, and he's watching the demo case speed up and down. And the guy in the jeans, Within five minutes, I knew this guy was the guy running the hospital. He was asking me really good questions, and he knew the Johns Controls Medicis system. You know, when, when he added, needed to add a new thermostat on the wall, he didn't call John, and he bought the thermostat. He put it in, and he programmed He'd been to school in Milwaukee on how to run their medicine. He, he knew his stuff. It became very obvious to me very quickly. So about 10 minutes into the meeting, the guy in the suit coat looked at the guy in the jeans and said, this is sexy, this is cool, but why is it important to me as director of facilities? Why do I care about, why are you wasting my time? Show me this. And the guy in the jeans said, saved you four hours of overtime Saturday night. Huh? You know, that got the suit's attention. He said, what? So yeah, at two o'clock in the morning, my beeper went off. And this is long ago. Went down to his kitchen table. Back then it was mowed and dialed in. It was before the World Wide Web. And looked and said, drive number seven and drive number eight are tripped offline. Let's drill down on the drive number eight. So drive number eight, fault code number 27. He looks on his list, 27, that's over voltage. Hmm. I'm gonna reset the fault. He watched the drive ramp back up, the static pressure stabilized, amp stabilized, cool. Goes the other one, same thing, reset the fault. He told the guy in the suco, he said, I went back to bed. I never got out of my pajamas. <laughs> I did it from my kitchen table. So in the old days, I would have had to get dressed, get my truck, 
drive down to the hospital, walk up to the drive, see over voltage, press reset, <laughs> go to the next one, press reset, go back home, try to get back to bed, get back to sleep, bet your ass I would charge at least four hours overtime as it was. I just went back to bed. <laughs> so the director of facilities looked at the HVAC rep and says, there'll be no other drives in this hospital because at the time we were the only ones that could do this stuff. So give me a fair quote from two to 200 horsepower with bypass, give me a fair price. I'm gonna compare it to your old quotes and then I'll give it to the contractor and say, you will buy ABB and you can put 10% on it and that's gonna be your price, you know. And we're still the standard in that hospital today. At the end of that story, as I said to the guy, did you ever, the, the facility director, he was fine, up and left. And I was ready to go because I've never heard anybody say to me before, there won't be any more competition in this hospital. I said, my job's done, you know. And uh, uh, I said to the, uh, the guy in the jeans, I said, did you ever figure out what happened? He said, yeah, I read in the newspaper on Sunday that some drunk went off the road, hit a telephone pole. When it went down, the transformer on that pole blew up, and that was the closest to the service entrance. These two drives out of the 27 were right next to the service entrance that took that shot, so they shut down to protect themselves. And I go, you know, we can program the drive to automatically reset itself on over voltage. You won't even get beeped the next time. So we were running around to the 27 drives and, and set them for automatic reset on over voltage. But so when you talk about the power of serial communications, I mean, saving points, saving costs, less boxes on the wall, that's cool. But the real savings can be in the labor and, and what, what you can save by doing stuff remotely from your kitchen table instead of having to go down to the facility. So, and we're doing all sorts of other fancy stuff. Uh, um, next generation products we're working on, alarming and trending and being able to proactively, once again, send alarms back to the energy management system before, long before you get to a shutdown situation. But my time is over, so I appreciate you staying late on the last day of the show, last session. So, any questions for anybody? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe we still have those in stock. So who's your, where are you at? Phoenix, Mechline? And he's not able to get them? He says he can't. Uh-oh. We, ABB has a law that says we have to support products for seven years after they become obsolete, but the 400 was more than seven years apparently so but you got I think so you if, if Butch says I'm not gonna question Butch he, he knows his stuff and so yeah so uh, he he works in repair much more than I do if he says we, he can't get him anymore <laughs> okay Tula Mary in, uh, okay well, unfortunately, like I said, we, we do our best, but some of the things, for example, the ACH 500 has a microprocessor on board that when we are getting towards out of supply, we went and, and the vendor said, do a last call like Intel. Then they sold the manufacturing rights to some little vendor and our price went from $2 a chip to $20 a chip. We did the last buy from them. He sold it to some guy, I think, making them in his garage and it went to $200 a chip, but to support customers, we went ahead and bought as many as we could from him, but there becomes a point where you just, yeah. you can't get the product anymore because nobody's making it. So, sorry about that. You'll like the 550, it's a good product. The, the ACH 550s, yeah, it's a, it's a rock solid bulletproof product. Any other questions? Go ahead. I specifically, that's what I do. There's a whole industrial application engineering group at ABB, uh, separate from our little group. We've got five HVAC application engineers in the HVAC group, but the industrial's got a whole cadre of their guys too. So, so I can give you a card and we can hook you up with the right guys if you've got an industrial. I, I pro I've been doing this for 30 years. I used to be in the industrial world. What's your question? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, we, we are the market share leader in HVAC drives. Uh, we have a, we're twice as big as number two and about five times as big as number three. And, uh, uh, you're, you're getting software information that all 
Right, right. So I, I work with the energy management companies on applying our product and finding out what's the important information that they want to optimize the, the efficient operation. Basically what we did is we realized that drives have relay outputs and analog outputs in them. They're going to because we use the same hardware in the industrial world as we do in the HVC world. So let's turn it over to these guys and, and work our way up in the value chain so that we're not just a drive anymore. We're a drive and an integral part of the energy management system. And if you use it properly, it's, it's an integral part of what's going on. So uh, uh, that's been our goal for the last several years and I think we've done some pretty substantial things. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I uh, um, that's a competitor's VFD in, in the training equipment. And I think they now have BACnet. Uh, uh, they didn't for quite some time, but I think they now have BACnet capability. Yeah, well, we, we expose all of our information to the OEMs, what they choose to pass on in there. And that's, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but that's one of the things that's frustrating for me. I'm on a lot of the BACnet committees and I go to the BACnet meetings and, you know, the very core behind BACnet is open. And then some of these OEMs are implementing proprietary BACnet objects. It's like, that's against the whole <laughs> premise here. <laughs> And, and we are working on that. I'm on an uh, application uh, working group for BACnet that there's going to be a back it, it AI, the a VFD application integration. If you want to say you're a VFD on BACnet and BTL listed, you must do this, this, and this. And of course, we were on the team driving it, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's all the stuff we already do, but you know. It's, it's setting the standard to say this is what a VFD should look like. And even to the, to the standpoint of reporting faults, overcurrent is always fault number one if you meet this application integration. So you, it doesn't matter if it's an ABB drive or whoever's drive, if you see this come back, you know what, the, what it is. But that's probably next year we're going to be releasing that application integration for VFDs. No, 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 we all have our own points list until this application integration comes out and there's BACnet required points from VFDs and then there's manufacturer specific. So the, the required points, they weren't going to take ABB's whole point list and implement it. They said what's important and I was honest with them. This, these are the ones just like we did here. These are the ones that are really important. Make sure they're in there and then there's manufacturer specific objects that we happen to have a boatload of them but they don't have to have those and today there's no rules i would recommend btl listing at a minimum whatever drive you're looking at putting on and that's not just abb anymore there's other drive manufacturers who are btl listed you go to backnet international.org and look under btl listings on the on the backnet website and it'll tell you who's actually done the testing and, and spent the money to go through the process but that still doesn't mean they may have 20 points of information or objects, as BACnet calls them, instead of the 95 I've been talking about. But they, they at least have been tested on the wire with other devices, and they're all playing nice, and everything works like it should. Yeah, well, but the other thing that requires uh, full disclosure is it's going to be different at different operating speeds, right? 
at 40 hertz, power is going to be different than at 60 hertz. So we need to develop the baseline in your facility, say clean filter is this is how much power it takes, dirty filter, here's where you set the trigger. And then after that, once we do that work, it's, it's standard, it's on board. Yeah, and a lot of the things, you know, every time we come out with a new points list, we have to recertify with Johnson, Siemens, and BACnet. So it's expensive. So what we often do is something like that. We'll program, we call it a supervisory output on one of our relays. And when we get to that dirty filter point, we'll fire the relay. Now there's no wires landed on that relay, but on the BACnet system, when that relay goes from on or off to on, you know it's time to change your filter. So you just say relay output three, this is what I've dedicated it for, is for filters loaded up, bam. So it's, it's the way we can do a lot of this information without having to retest every time we think of a new idea. We just program it, monitor it, tie it to that relay, boom. Oh. Right, that's standard as well. Mm-hmm. Well, we've got stuff like this. This is what I mentioned with the energy calculators. So we can display right on our keypad and using this thing we got, we call it mailbox commands. You can read or write to any point in the VFD just by going to the back net front end and setting up. I want to read this once every 10 minutes or every two days or whatever. So we do the energy calculations, have it up on the keypad, and then also suck it down to the front end. And when the R&D boys were coming up with this, I'm like, why are you spending your time? We've had this for 30 years. We feed back to John's controls how much kilowatts they're using. It's not rocket science to subtract from a baseline, you know, Baseline kilowatts, kilowatts I'm using, multiplier times 10 cents a kilowatt hour, it's easy, but what I didn't think about, somebody has to hire, and I'm not picking on Johnson Controls, pick a different name, Novar, whoever, to write the code to do that, and unless it's specified, you're gonna, be, you're gonna pay for it. So now, we just do it in the VFD, and we darned if it, I thought it was worthless, but it's turned out to be a very popular feature. And I think it's mainly, mainly because our we all like to be told we made a good decision, purchasing decision. So when you walk past this every day and that number keeps going up on the keypad and you're walking past with your boss, you make sure, hey, look at this. Oh, thanks for specking that ABB drive. And then the boss calls the consulting engineer and says, you know, thanks for specking that ABB drive up to $12,000 in savings so far. You know, I didn't think it was important at all. It's turned out to be a very popular feature. So that's any drive since 2008 has this. Previous to 2008, we didn't have this built into the VFD. Yes, sir? Do you have another question? All right, well, thanks for all your great questions and 